I'm, I'm here for this theme. So Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. It's good to see everyone. Um, I, this week, am going to take a bit of a departure from the norm. We're not going to look at Parshat Nassau. Uh, it's my last opportunity to be here on a Saturday afternoon teaching. Um, and that's sad and precious. Hmm? I will be um, starting as the rabbi of Congregation Amtikva in San Francisco. San Francisco um, itself? Oh, <laughs> shade. Is it in San Francisco itself? Uh, it is in San Francisco itself. It's around the corner from the SF State. So it's like. The fundraiser for the Bar Mitzvah on June 1st. Your wife is on the side. Thank you so much. Oh, amazing. That sounds great. Well, we'll talk. Um, so that said, one of the things I did outside of my time at Bethlehem this year was work on my rabbinic thesis. And, um, and I wanted to bring some of that to this space and to have a chance to share it with you. Um, and so before we jump into the text, let me give you a bit of framing both on the thesis, why I did it, and the material that we're going to be looking at today. So um, my thesis was a Jewish annotation of a section of the fourth chapter of the Quran. And what I mean by that is taking a section and saying, how, do we, how can we look at this from a Jewish lens? find the points of connection, view it in the right context. It's a very different sort of scripture than Tanakh is. So what are the right genres and modes in which to read it? And how can we do this in a way that feels honest, not apologetic, and also informative, right? So that we can say, like, we can look at it with clear eyes and, and perhaps understand it in a more direct personal way. Because I know that before I started, um, being interested in this sort of material, I had never cracked open a Quran and I didn't feel very comfortable doing so because, you know, I'd heard a lot about it and I didn't have much reference or like direct experience. Um, my interest in this originally came from my experiences in Israel and feeling like, wow, I'm traveling through this country and I love it and I don't understand all the street signs. You know, like, there's, a, there's this language here that's totally impervious to me. And how could I understand this place better if I could speak this language that's also represented in this space? And, um, and so that was an experience I had in late high school. And so then I ended up studying Arabic in college after I'd kind of maxed out on all of my options for Hebrew. I like, took as much Hebrew as I could. And then they were like, okay, you need to start something new. So I said, okay, great. This is my chance to learn Arabic. So, um, so I had done that work back in college, took a break from my 20s, and then at the end of my rabbinical school year said, I'd love to reconnect to that from a rabbinic lens and see what this looks like now. Um, so I spent the last year uh, working with Rabbi Reuben Firestone, uh, who's my dear advisor, whom some of you know, and um, this is really his, his field of expertise. So it was an incredible honor and opportunity to be able to study with him. So that's, that's me approaching this. Um, and it would be the, I think, there aren't very many texts that try to do this sort of annotation of Quran, but there's a great resource called uh, the, Jewish, the Jewish Annotated New Testament, if you want that version by Amy Jill Levine. So this is kind of the same style of project, but for the Quran instead of the New Testament. Okay, any, any questions or reactions? Just like really, okay. Okay, so we're gonna keep, <laughs> keep moving because there's a lot to cover. So um, things to think about when, um, like when I was doing my annotation, I focused on you know linguistic connection. So Quran, you know how we call often Tanakh we call Hamikra, same root as Quran. That Kufresh Aleph root is the same in both languages. It means like a call or something spoken or recited. So it started as an oral medium, right? It started as an oral text. Um, so I was looking at the linguistic connections like that, mythological connections, which is part of what we'll look at today, <laughs> legal connections and contrast, which is the other thing we'll look at today. Um, and I was specifically focusing on the fourth chapter. There's a lot of um, gender law uh, in the fourth chapter. And so I specifically, um, and I ended up talking a lot about inheritance law. So what we'll get to today is first a, an a origin myth for um, heterosexual partnership and then we'll get to the inheritance law section. Um, now, last introductory note is that uh, when reading, when you're looking at Quranic text, remember that it's all prophetic. It's all prophetic language, right? So like, it's a, think of how, when you, when you read Nevi'im, how like, you know, Heschel said, the, the pitch is an octave too high. 
right? It, the, um, that Nevi'im are, in a sense, always shouting. They're trying to get a message through. And all the material in Quran is, is prophetic material. So you can, receive, you can read it with that. That's how somebody, uh, you'd say a confessionist, like so that's how somebody who is Muslim would receive this, is that it's, um, it's a directive. The other thing is that um, Islam started in the seventh century. So relative to Jewish text, we already had all of Tanakh and the canon had closed, right? Um, the New Testament had also come along. Right? And, but Jewishly, we're all already past Mishnah and into Midrash and, and starting Talmud, right? or like into Talmud. So, so we have a lot of oral material that is dominant in the Jewish world in addition to the written material of Tanakh. Is that, are you, well, yeah, okay. So, so often when people look at the evolution and contrasting, um, the, the evolution of Abrahamic scriptures, they think they their first instinct is to go okay well this was developed off of this and this was developed off of this everything from what came before it but actually the more accurate way to look at quran is to think of it as being influenced by all that oral material so we'll so when we're reading the, our first text here we'll read this first verse this first ayah and then contrast it with midrash not with tanakh so because that's more contemporaneous to it. That's what would have been floating around as, you know, in among the Jews of the, the Hejaz, of the Arabian Peninsula. Okay. Okay. Any questions on introduction or framing? Yes. In the Sunder title where you're calling the origins of heterosexual partnership. Yeah. Is that their language or are you distinguishing this from marriage? Oh, um, no, this is my language. And I it's not exclusively separate from marriage. It's actually, you could use marriage. They, they would have used marriage. Who is they? I'm saying within the Quran. They're, they're they yes, yes. Okay. okay, so so this specific <laughs> verse does not, does not specify marriage, but marriage is a dominant concept in, in the Quran, yes. Um, in fact, in the legal material on inheritance, we'll get into, you know, what the wife receives <laughs> from the estate, things like that. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so let's dive in. So text, the first text that we're gonna look at is origin of uh, heterosexual marriage. And, um, and so this here is the very first ayah, which means symbol or sign, but also can mean verse um, of the fourth chapter of the Quran. So could somebody read this in English, please? Joey, go ahead. O oh, mankind, be conscious of your Lord, who created you from one soul divided from its fellow, and from them spread many men and women. Be conscious of God, from whom you request rights and family relations. Indeed, God has been watching over you. Thank you. Okay, so, so if you, how do you understand this origin myth as it's outlined here? If you were to, uh, say, write a script or outline a script for a movie or a montage sequence, like, what would it look like? Can you describe the scene? Well, as a, I see a parallel to Adam and Eve in this one. Okay, parallels to Adam and Eve. How so? Because they were the first man and woman, respectively. Mm -hmm. Yeah, first man and woman and partners. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Similar. We have the pru or vu parallel of like, there should be, this should be a fruitful, productive partnership of many children. But it's very different to me, mm -hmm. it seems, because God is the dominant one. He doesn't create first man or then create woman. It's just he creates. Creates. And both. Together at the together. same time. Right. So it's and more Genesis 2 than 1. From his fellow. Right. He created from one. So it's one. And then he divided. Mm -hmm. And spread many men and women. It's very general. It's not really a, unless later on there's a story that goes with this, mm -hmm. like in the Torah. This specific uh, model appears a few definite. times, but it doesn't have any narrative attached. Yeah. It's just oh, this. Oh, it doesn't. This yeah. is it. Yeah. So you're supposed to, so God is definitely above everything. Yes. No questions asked. No questions asked. Yeah. God is above. <laughs> and I want to specifically pull out what you said around created at the same time and split. 
just naming that. Okay, Sandra? Yeah, I was, I was just going to say that, that, no, 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 that rather than what we have creating a DOM and then later a problem, mm -hmm. this was, I'm, I'm picturing it as the soul is like some amorphous one big thing and then it's divided and then from that it's divided into other people, mm -hmm. like if you're asking me to see it in terms of people, it's actually quite different. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, that is quite different. And is anyone familiar with, without turning the page, a midrash that might have something to do with this or might sound similar? Is it something you've heard before? Yeah, Alan? Yeah, that, that uh, Can it was like you mic. created man and woman androgynously. It's like is one, is one soul. They were together, and it was from that that everything split off, which is very similar to what's going on right here. Great. So can you read our next section, please? <laughs> Turn the page and read it in English. <laughs> and God said, let us make humankind in our image after our likeness. Rabbi Yumyahu ben Elazar said, in the hour when the Holy One created the first human, God created him as an androgyny as it is said, male and female, God created them. Rabbi Shmuel ben Nachmani said, in the hour when the Holy One created the first human, God created him with two faces, Dupard Trufin, and sawed him and made him backs, a back here and a back there. They responded to him, but it says, God took one of his ribs. He said to them, it means from one of his sides, just as you would say, and for the side of the tabernacle, which they translate in Aramaic for the side. Yes, yes, tzela means side, and we have it, we often translate it as rib, but it can also mean side in this other context. And so the rabbi saw that and said, oh, well, this sounds like this origin story, right? And wrote it as midrash. With an iron. With an iron. Yeah. On the first page, though, I guess I didn't notice it the first time. Marshall, can we, do you want to use the, the microphone? Conscious of your Lord who created you from one soul, uh, divided from its fellow. So there's a, there's no element here of physicality, but it seems to be some kind of a, I'll say, a spiritual, uh, you know, creation. Hmm, that's a great point. That there isn't a physicality in the Quran version of this story. Right, but in the midrash, it is very physical. It's like your body divided. Yeah. Um, now let's look also, and then we can reflect back on all three together. There is a non-religious space in which this <laughs> eyes lit up. Yes, in which this same uh, story comes up, and this is really interesting for me to start looking at all the different ways that this story gets told in our tradition and in others. So in Plato's Symposium, um, there is a section called The Speech of Aristophanes, and it's a, um, it's a philo philosophical um, statement on eros, on, on sexual love. And, um, and so the way it's described, at least by, um, by Dover here, is once upon a time, all human beings were double creatures, each with two heads, two bodies, and eight limbs. Then, by the command of Zeus, each double creature was cut in half, and so humans, as we know them, came into being. Every one of us seeks his other half, and this is the search of Eros. If we are pious, we may hope to be rewarded by the search. If we are impious, Zeus may cut us in two again, and each of us will be like a flat fish or a figure in relief. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of flat fish out there, but you know, there's always more fish in the sea, so it's okay. Uh, <laughs> um, so so how, do, how does it feel to see the Midrash kind of sandwiched by these two stories in context? We're not, we're not attributing one as being the true original here. I want to make that really clear. Um,
Does it does it change how you view the midrash beyond putting it in the context of we're all trying to explain what we see in life? I I think well I, so Plato would have come first <laughs> as far like temporally. Um, I think that, I'll tell you what, I think that sometimes there's uh, a feeling of, oh, when we make our texts academic like this, we pull the heart and soul out of them. And I, I worry about that in this sort of study, because you can say, oh, like this is just a story made up by people, and like it's, you know, it goes back to, you know, Plato preceded it, therefore we must have gotten it from Plato or from Greco-Roman culture, which doesn't always feel very good, right? But I would add that I think, I think Sandra's exactly on point, that, these, that there's um, an element of holiness in, um, in like the shared search and the shared truth that we are all seeking to understand this. And, um, and like origin myths are, are one of humanity's ways to like get, give meaning and get meaning from life. And so to say, oh, you know, there is, a, there is a deep origin to my, to the love I have with my partner. And that is, um, that comes from something before either of us met is, um, that's really meaningful and that matters. Like that's very valid. That's not, you know, it's holy. Exactly, exactly. So when I look at all these different texts, um, I think that we're all accessing something that is true and holy in different ways. Um, let's move on because we don't have much time. Um, but we're not going to read the entirety of the next two texts uh, because they're very uh, long, especially the second one. Uh, I'm going to give some framing and just move us through this to, to teach it rather than we'll have a moment to explore it at the end. The first text here, um, where it says Surat um, Anisa 4-7, um, this is a verse that says that you must give, um, you must make a bequest to your, uh, to the people around you when you pass away. You must give a will. And, and the will is, there is a portion for the men, and then there's a portion for the women, and whether it's a lot or a little, there's a required portion. This is one of the most egalitarian inheritance verses in the Quran. And what's really interesting is that this is the model for the Shiite um, inheritance system. That's what it tends toward is a basically a gender equal distribution model entirely premised upon proximity of relationship to the deceased. Turn the page. Hmm? It is progressive, yeah. Um, so in looking at Jewish comparative material to think like how, you know, if we're, if we're starting in Jewish place, where would we go with this? Well, I didn't expect to encounter inheritance law when I started reading this chapter of the Quran. So I had to go and learn the Jewish inheritance law in order to make sure that I knew what I was comparing. Um, a lot of it comes up in Mishnah Bava Batra uh, in chapter eight. And here's an interesting one where it says the son and the daughter it says, Echad ben ve'echad habat So, like, there is both son and daughter in the inheritance, right? Like, one for one, uh, implying that perhaps they are alike in what they receive. And then it immediately contradicts it, which the Talmud, we didn't have time to go into here, but there's an extensive discussion where there are four rabbinic theories on what does it mean that it says that you know, echad haben echad habat, and then immediately goes into, but the son takes a double portion. You're like, well, okay, what does that mean? Yeah, Alan? Firstborn son. Firstborn son, yes. Firstborn son takes a double portion. Um, interesting side note, uh, biblical uh, law gives the firstborn son the double portion. Uh, rabbinic law does not have um, 
the the double portion model it has a lot more attention given to women and, and like wives and daughters and what they inherit and land is privatized and can be distributed regardless of tribe which is very different from what we see in say the daughters of Tzalofahad's story in numbers right where they argue for their inheritance but then their marriages must be within their own tribe so that you don't misdistribute the lands that God has designated for each tribe. Very important in Torah, less so in Mishnah. And um, so there's this academic um, who at JTS, Milgram, who says like it's probably um, drawing more on the Greco-Roman legal system that had privatized land and uh, equal distribution regardless of gender. So. Okay, so that's the Mishnah Bava Vatra 8.4. But then a few verses later in the Quran, we get something entirely different. Flip the page. We're now on the third to last page. It should say 4.11 through 12 if you're following online. And um, I'm not going to read through all of this because uh, it's a bit brain breaky. There's uh, actually a quote in the oral tradition of, of Islam that says, uh, that Muhammad said that studying the laws of inheritance is half of all knowledge because there's so much, he doesn't say this, that's the quote, and the assumption is there's so much math in, in it that like the algebra, algebra as a word, came from um, Arabic because Islamic scholars are trying to figure out how to do all the math to distribute inheritance portions. So, um, so we end up with this sort of thing. Uh, for the boys, equivalent of two girls, but if there's two women, then they receive two thirds of inheritance. If there's only one, then she gets half. Uh, you know, it, so it breaks it down exactly by like how many of each gender, by what degree of separation, and then what are the fractions that each one of them should receive. And among all of this is always the caveat that a wife is sustained on one eighth of her husband's estate. Yes, one eighth. So this is much more mathematical, much less gender equitable. Um, this is the, the, pre the basis for Sunni inheritance law, very different system from Shia. Yeah, so, um, and in legal terms, we would say this is intestate succession, right? It does, like, testate succession means you have a last will and testament. You decide for yourself how you're going to distribute everything. Intestate means you don't get to decide. There's a very clear, like, you are told by the state or by the religion, um, this is how your property will be divided. And, and so it's a different model. And we have that too <laughs> in Judaism, right? It can, so two, two psukim before, or two mishnayot before, sorry, um, before what we read before, we have this. The order uh, for inheritance is this. If a man dies and he has no son, he should pass his inheritance to his daughter. Fine, that's from uh, the story of daughters of Tzalofachad. But then this is if a son precedes a daughter. And then descendants of the son precede a daughter, and daughter precedes the brothers, and descendants of a daughter precede the brothers. And we have a kind of a similar thing. Um, the exact division is different. Um, also, you'll note that there isn't a sense of um, exactly what fraction each relative is given in this. Uh, it's only order of precedence. Um, but it was interesting to see these two different models. And we're almost out of time. But are there any? <laughs> Um, I, so thank you for going with me on this fast and wild ride through sections of my thesis. And I would love to hear from you any questions you have about the material or just on undertaking a project like this and why it would be important. Yeah, Gary. Yeah, I don't think it's ever explained in the text. Um, like Jews, uh, Muslims have an interpretive tradition that is premised upon scholarly authority um, and actually very similar hermeneutical principles of like, if you interpret something and there's strong consensus around your opinion, it will ha hold more weight than otherwise. Um, I didn't get a chance to read all of that <laughs> for this thesis, so I couldn't tell you exactly what the dominant opinions are. But the idea is that women are generally not employed um, in, in the society in which this originated. And so they would de be dependent upon men's wealth in order to be sustained. And it, it's much, it, it's similar in Judaism in that like, like think about when Boaz uh, marries, marries uh, Naomi and he says, 
now he does it in order to now be the owner of the material that she's been guardian of in the meantime right so she's not being sustained on a portion but she's also not inheriting her husband's wealth right she is she's holding it until she finds a new husband mm -hmm. so um hmm? oh. well i think that yeah women could not hold the entirety of their husband's estates in either system and why one eighth specifically, I don't know, but it couldn't be a majority because she then would become a landowner and it, um, and there needed to be a certain amount distributed to the sons and daughters. This is a good question. How is the widow supported? Uh, because it's not articulated here. I, I, there are other sections of this same chapter um, that, yes, yes, uh, that do ad address what the widow would inherit. Um, it's not a majority. I'm trying to remember exactly what, like, I'm, I'm not remembering what the exact number is, and I'll defer to the rabbis in the room. Um, <laughs> I will defer to. Okay, I will defer to the other rabbis in the room. Is that okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, uh, I'm just going to repeat that for the folks on Zoom, which is that the widows were guaranteed sustenance by a, the estate of their husbands, but they would not inherit from them. Um, yeah. What's the guarantee of sustenance? What, who defines it? Yeah, there's... there's um, her living expenses, you know, that she wouldn't be thrown out on the street, food, clothing. Yeah, yeah there's there's a lot of commentary on that. Yeah. Um, Marshall? Mm -hmm. Muhammad was around 630 or so? Yeah, by the time he was giving prophecy, more like 670, 680. So, uh, yeah. Again, the question is, when, is, when does Midrash come in again? Is that early? Yeah, that's earlier. So that would be like 4th century. No? But the, the Midrash is contemporaneous with both the Mishnah and the Torah, right? The Haggadah is the earliest um, text of Midrash that we have. And there's also Midrash being written The question was one of clarification of the timeline, and that there would have been several hundred years of midrash before, um, before we get to Quranic text. Yeah. Um, also, remember there were Jews. Like I didn't write on this section, but there were Jews that the early Muslim converts interacted with, or even tried to convert from. So, um, if I get to continue this project, like that'll obviously be an area of interest to write on. That, those dynamics, which are sometimes good and sometimes bad, you know, and some of those texts are interesting to read and some of them are uncomfortable. And, you know, 
this is what happens. We have different religions, and we don't want to pretend like they're not uncomplicated in how they intersect sometimes. Okay, thank you. Shabbat shalom. <laughs>